Hello there. Um, Nato Thompson, the Artistic Director at Creative Time. Um, we're a New York-based public arts organization. It's good to be in Greece with you, virtually. I'm there with you in spirit as we speak. My spirit is coming through the camera and infusing the room. I uh, am going to talk about the intersections of art and politics um, as it pertains to cultural programming. I um, have been at Creative Time for 10 years. And we have for a long time done public art commissions that work to some degree around the questions of art and social change. Some projects more than others, and we can get into that. Um, we also host a annual summit, which is going on its eighth year, and it's a conversation, it's a bit of a platform for artists that work at the intersection of art and social justice to come together. So it's just, and even before I got to Creative Time, I worked at Mass Mocha, uh, which is a museum of contemporary art in Massachusetts, and I did projects around art and social justice. And so it's been something that's very much on my mind a lot. Now, I want to talk about a few specific projects. Since my time is brief, I'm going to be brief with the projects as well. And then I just also had a book come out that I want to kind of talk about, at least in terms of its implications for cultural work. So the first thing I'll talk about is when I first got to Creative Time, I did a project with the artist Paul Chan in New Orleans, two years after the hurt flood uh, the Hurricane Katrina uh, flood, and New Orleans was quite devastated, and Paul Chan conceived of the idea, which was quite unoriginal, and he said so much, was to basically take the same project that Susan Sontag had done in Yugoslavia and do it in New Orleans, which was to reproduce Samuel Beckett's play Waiting for Godot in the landscape of the Ninth Ward and a neighborhood called Gentilly. And that project was quite... Um, inspirational and informative because, as Paul Chan said during the process of that, we were going to organize that project Hezbollah style, as he put it, meaning he wanted to go door to door and talk to people about the concept and see what they thought and get feedback. And then the back story to this project would be community organizing. And that really informed the project, although at the end of the day, the play itself, Waiting for Godot, stayed the same. It was a play put on by the uh, theater company, the Harlem, Sh the Harlem Theater Company, starring a gentleman named Wendell Pierce, who was in the show The Wire and Treme. And it was an extraordinarily successful project. And I say successful in so much as those that came were from the neighborhoods. When we first started talking to people about this, they said no one from the neighborhoods would come. And simultaneously, they said nobody that's outside of the neighborhoods would come either. So basically, we're told no one would arrive. But in fact, it was quite important uh, for people to come in. It wasn't directly political. It was much more melancholic, absurdist, dreamy. And in that, in the space of all those dreams, became a, a vehicle, a vessel. The play became a vessel for a lot of emotion. And as one of the folks we met in the community, named Robert Green, said, everyone in New Orleans is used to waiting. Whether, whether you're waiting for your insurance check, whether you're waiting for your for the bus to pick you up, whether you're waiting for a FEMA trailer, whether you're waiting, waiting, waiting. So it became an important project. Another project we did in 2008 was at the first, at the election, oh my God, eight years ago, of President Obama, and it was a show called Democracy in America. And rather than looking to the upcoming Obama years, it was reflecting on the previous eight years of a gentleman named George Bush, and uh, the de Democracy in America was an opportunity to think through a project of democracy. And we had commissions all across the United States with the artist Sharon Hayes, with the artist Mark Tribe, with the artist Steve Powers, and the a duo of artists Rodney McMillan and Olga Kumandaris. And each of them did a project across America, site-specific thinking about the project of democracy. In addition, we produced a social space at the Park Avenue Armory, which had speeches, and a massive installation is a sort of hub for people to come together and think through, on an activist base, uh, the question of democracy. In 2009, we worked with the artist Jeremy Deller on a road trip across America um, about the Iraq War. And that project, um, which was called It Is What It Is, Conversations About Iraq, consisted of a blown-up car from Baghdad a U.S. soldier and an Iraqi who had just come back from the war zone and were on hand next to this blown-up car 
to have conversations across the southern belt of America about what they experienced. And an interesting anecdote about that project was, and I talk about this a lot, for many people we encountered, the project didn't work. And I say that in an interesting way, only in so much as often when it comes to political art, you will encounter people that think it does not work. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Well, on, the, on one side, the activists said to us, well, this isn't political because it's too ambiguous. You're just having conversations without any kind of efficacy, without any utility. You know, as one guy said, this is like going to New Orleans at the height of the flood of Katrina and you want to talk about the merits of spice, of, of Cajun food. Well, there's something urgent here. You need to be directly political. So for activists, the project wasn't political. For the art writer in the New York Times, it was very political, but not necessarily art. So Ken Johnson wrote, wrote well, this may be a therapeutic project for a nation healing from a dramatic war, but I don't think it necessarily constitutes as art. So there you have it. One person thought it wasn't art, another one thought it wasn't activism. Well, it's something. And so often in projects, we find ourselves in the midst of this, these kind of tensions pulling at each other. Another project more recently we took on was a project with the Weeksville Heritage Center. It was a long-term collaboration where we started thinking about art in cities more on an infrastructural level, and particularly thinking about race and class as it applies to a neighborhood. So this project collaborated with this house museum called Weeksville, which was dedicated and on the site of a historic, self-intentional uh, black community from the early 19th century. And they were founded by a guy named John Weeks, who was interested in having African Americans at that time buy property, because if you own property, you could then vote. So this, this intentional community arose that then was lost to time, then rediscovered in the 1960s, and became a historic house museum, and they became our partner. And what the, week, the project was called Black Radical Brooklyn, Funk God, Jazz, and Medicine. And it was an opportunity to partner with self-organized black institutions with artists where the money from projects would go to support their ongoing work in the community and to put those institutions into conversations with each other. So we worked with the artist Simone Lee with an institution called the Stuyvesant Mansion. We worked with the artist Zenobia Bailey with the Boys and Girls High School. We worked with the group Otabenga Jones and the um, Jazz Consortium. And we worked with the artist Bradford Young with the church Bethel Tabernacle AME. Side note, Bradford Young is up for an Oscar for cinematography on the sci-fi epic Arrival. Just name dropping there. Um, anyways, that project was important because one of the things I've been really interested in is that the money from projects is a part of its politics that the money goes into radical movements, that it goes into infrastructure. If you think about biennials like Documenta or Venice Biennial, what if all that money that's dumped into artworks actually went into stable structures that lasted over time? That was the kind of thought, the crucible, which we were thinking about in that project. I'm giving you a whirlwind tour of some projects, but I also wanted to quickly mention the, my book, which is called Culture is a Weapon, the Art of Influence in Everyday Life. And one of the things that comes in from that book that I think is important for the conference to think through is that art is not just the territory of artists. And in fact, many of the skill sets that have been learned by artists in the early part of the 20th century are now being used by corporate culture, marketing culture, everyday culture on a vast level, using signs and symbols, using images, using social relationships as a way to produce a feeling. Relational aesthetics, conceptualism, performance, these are not just in the hands of artists. They're in a lot of different forms of power. And it's not necessarily all for good. And so we live in a very complex cultural landscape that we, as cultural producers, in order to be effective and political, need to also consider the ethical implications of that which we take on. Thank you so much for your time.